And the first speaker is Christos Bampis from Netflix. He will be presenting a paper titled Improving Netflix uh, Video Quality with Neural Networks. You are very welcome. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dan, and good morning, everyone. I'll try to you know, wake everybody up. Uh, so yeah, I'm very happy to be here today and present uh, a joint work between uh, Li Heng Chen, Ji Li, and uh, myself on improving Netflix video quality with uh, neural networks. Now, before I jump into the you know, very specifics of the presentation, I want to paint a little bit of the context around why this work makes sense for our team. Uh, and at a very high level, the charter of our team is you know, to continuously push boundaries in technology such that we can bump up the video quality uh, for the uh, Netflix member, right? So this work is just one piece of this larger uh, you know, puzzle that uh, the team is invested uh, in. Okay, so with that, let's uh, jump into it. So what did we do? Okay, uh, we basically developed uh, neural networks to improve downscaling that is done during cloud-based encoding, right? So to give a little bit of introduction uh, behind our encoding and streaming pipeline, Imagine you have a source, um, typically a studio high quality source at let's say 4K uh, native resolution. And then we would typically downscale it to different encoding resolutions. So you can imagine going from 4K to 1080, 720, uh, so on and so forth. And that's something you want to do, you know, to create multi-resolution adaptive bitrate ladders, be able to adjust to varying network conditions and also uh, different screen sizes that uh, clients would have. After you downscale, then uh, of course you have to compress uh, the uh, visual signal. So you can imagine some encoder, let's say like AV1, which enables you to uh, take these raw pixels and transform them into a, uh, you know, a series of uh, zeros and ones, right? Create the bitstream itself. And all that happens on the Netflix uh, cloud uh, pipeline. After these bits are created, then they are uh, fed in, uh, and they travel through the internet, they arrive to the client device, which subsequently will decode the signal, uh, the bitstream, and then upscale it typically to the uh, full uh, screen size. And that happens on the, let's say, other side of, the, uh, of this you know, pretty end-to-end -end, uh, pipeline. So uh, here what we said is, okay, instead of doing downscaling with a traditional interpolation-based uh, method, let's say Langsos, which is a fairly robust one, or uh, even by Cubic, uh, what if we replaced that step with a neural network approach? And that actually has a, a magic, let's call it property, that if you are able to do this in a codec ag agnostic way, then you can basically improve the uh, quality for the member um, at the end without really needing to change anything else. So you don't really need to change your encoder, um, and the client doesn't need to know about, about this change. So you can, you can think of it as a drop-in solution that uh, increases quality while leaving everything else in this uh, quite complicated uh, setup intact. So that's, uh, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, now, uh, how did we do it, right? So our neural networks, and we, we use a term uh, deep downscaler to refer to them, are basically trained to uh, produce the best downsampled representation. And you know, best is, uh, you know, optimality is also subject to what is the loss function that you have defined. So in this case, we can simply think of it as a reconstruction error between an input, the, let's say, uh, higher resolution input on the far left with the downscaled and then upscaled version on the far right, which is the, uh, the output. So during training, we want to make sure that this, uh, this error is, uh, is minimized. Now, there is a tricky aspect here, which is that in the field, it's not just downscaling and upscaling that happens. As I mentioned, there is a, you know, a very important step, which is the encoder. And if you uh, have a hybrid video codec implementation, it's not, you know, it's non-trivial to, um, uh, to optimize against it because there is a non-differentiability uh, that, that kicks in. So during training, we remove the encoder from, uh, from this uh, setup. We assume uh, by cubic up sampling as a, let's, let's think of it as a ubiquitous uh, thing that we can, uh, an assumption that we can make. And that's how we train uh, our downscaler, which can create uh, the picture that you see uh, in the center. Uh, I will not go into the you know, details of uh, why is the architecture like that or why did we pick this many number of layers. We, unfortunately, we don't have time, but I can briefly sketch uh, the idea. So downscaling is not you know, a, a too, uh, too challenging task um, as compared to, let's say, some, some, some harder like synthesis or, or generation, like uh, bigger 
uh, uh, space generations. So in this case, we said, okay, let's try using a few custom-made and you know carefully placed uh, convolutional layers that will get uh, the job done. So here, the setup that we have is a few layers on the left, starting from the left to right, on the left, a few layers to do pre-processing of the signal before you do the actual resizing, right? So we have three layers that you can see there. Then we have um, a block that does the um, resizing step, this red block that you see in the middle, and then a few layers after for, uh, let's say, the post-processing of the signal after it goes through this, uh, this resizing. Uh, the idea here is to basically create uh, a few residuals, so it's, um, uh, it's based on residual learning on top of a, a robust and a, and a downscaler that we sort of know and we don't want to stray very far, uh, very far from. So in this case, you can, you can see we have bicubic denoted on the center of, of the slide. So uh, upon learning these residuals, you superimpose them on, on the existing downscaler and that gives you your, uh, your final output on the far right. Now, to get some intuition about, okay, what does the network uh, really uh, do? What does it uh, learn? Uh, at a very high level, it compensates mostly for frequencies lost due uh, to downscaling for areas, you know, uh, with, with strong energy, so, you know, edges or uh, regions with rich texture. So to visualize this, you can see a sample still picture of a, of a source video, and then two frames of the residuals that uh, are being uh, um, um, learned before the, uh, you know, in the pre-filtering step before you do the downscaling, and in this case the downscaling factor is uh, down by two, and the residuals that you have after uh, you do the, the downscaling. And you can pretty much see that it's, uh, you know, not on the sky area, which is a very, very smooth one, but mostly on the, on the textures on, on this uh, very impressive slope, uh, I would say. Now, um, of course, you, you have a network, so you really need to check what, what did the network give as an output. So here you can, uh, you can see a sample, uh, you know, side-by-side -side comparison of uh, downscaling and then upscaling, where uh, on the left you have downscaling by Langsos, and the upscaler is kept the same, it's by cubic, and on the right you have the uh, deep downscaler approach, so our uh, neural network approach. Now, depending on your viewing distance and your viewing angle, you may not be able, uh, everybody, to see the exact same amount, you know, the exact same um, uh, quality improvement, but uh, basically what we can see is better uh, detail preservation, especially on, you know, when there are these uh, strong lines on, the, on this uh, green wall, on the kid's face, and also um, on the bird. So um, it does a much better job, uh, in my opinion. But of course, you know, just lo looking at one uh, pair frame, uh, uh, um, just the picture doesn't say much, so we really spent quite some time to evaluate uh, our networks. So uh, the first way we do it is we rely on objective metrics. We are uh, definitely uh, into that. And um, a very standard way to do it is by, you know, this rate distortion um, analysis. So what do you do? You create a bunch of encodes for different resolutions, and you record on the x-axis the bit rate. Here it's measured in uh, kilobits per second. And on the y-axis, you uh, report uh, a perceptual video quality metric. And uh, of course, we use VMAF uh, predominantly. And uh, what do you do? You create two curves. Here you have the white curve that represents the uh, rate distortion behavior of Langsos downscaling. And the red one is the deep downscaler. You, you can superimpose them here, and uh, you can measure things like beyond target delta uh, rate and measure uh, your encoding gains. In this case, uh, we measured 5% gains on average, and by average, I mean, you know, over uh, many, many different contents, different encoding settings, different uh, resolutions. So, you know, this is, this is just an instance. This curve that you see here is just an instance uh, of a particular content, but in fact, we, we, uh, we look at this on a, on a much bigger aggregate to make sure that uh, our numbers make sense. And, of course, this is an ablation study, meaning that uh, we always use the same encoder when we compare, you know, Langsos versus uh, the deep downscaler, and we use the same upsampler. So we, you know, we always make sure we, we, our uh, comparisons are, are fair. Now, objective metrics, you know, we, we really like them. We, we, we work a lot on them, but they don't say the full story. So we definitely want to be more rigorous, more, more scientific in our results. And besides objective analysis, we also uh, do lots of subjective testing. And in this case, we did um, a quite big of a test with paired comparison. So, you know, we, we brought in people and we asked them, like, hey, on the left is one, uh, one clip, on the right you see another clip, which one is better? We wouldn't tell them, you know, which one is which, so we would randomize everything, bring people in, experts, non-experts, to, you know, have a, a fair representation of, of actual 
uh, people that, that, will that will watch the streams, and we ask them, you know, which one uh, is better. So here I'm just, you know, sun signing two important numbers. There is definitely lots more detail here, but uh, in terms of preferences, let's say 75% approximately of people preferred the neural network version. It's not like they did not prefer the other one, but there, there will be times, you know, where the preferences will be at par. Uh, especially, let's say, if you go from 4K to 1080, there is not really uh, much difference that you can expect there. Besides coming up with this number, we also do statistical, we, we bound our measurements with, uh, you know, confidence interval standard errors to make sure that our numbers make sense and, then, you know, they are not just some, some random noise. So we found a pretty good statistical significance around 80, uh, 82 percent. Now, coming up with a research prototype is, is cool and everything, but definitely there is another big effort which is not only to build the prototype, but bring it in front of, of the Netflix member, right? And we spent uh, quite some time also in, uh, in, this, um, in this thread, let's say. Uh, again, I will not give you too many details because we don't have too much time, but I'll, I'll sketch it. Uh, we basically deployed our neural networks as part of uh, our encoding microservices and uh, the Cosmos platform that we have developed uh, within Netflix. So you can think of this as a containerized application, right, as a microservice running all these different uh, encoding workloads, and inside that job, before we do the actual encoding, we can also insert our, uh, our solution, which we implement as an FFmpeg filter, that when, uh, you know, uh, you do the neural network inferencing, that's the, the downscaling operation. So you have everything in that, uh, in that box, and then, of course, subsequently, you will do your, uh, your encoding. Now, if you want to know more details about Cosmos and our, uh, our encoding microservice platform, you can also look at, I have a, a reference on the bottom of the slide. And, of course, it's not just prototype but uh, deployment, but you also need to make sure your, your product is a viable one and it's really cost efficient. You don't want to, you know, uh, be a bottleneck, computational bottleneck, and especially for neural networks, that's an important consideration. So we uh, went through a very rigorous and iterative uh, effort where we said, okay, let's try to uh, simplify, right, and, and uh, cut down costs. Uh, from the start, let's say our V0 uh, to the end, uh, we saw a pretty uh, uh, good improvement of about a magnitude, maybe even more. Uh, and some of the things that we uh, leveraged to make that happen is that we do Luma-only prediction, you know, to bring down the number of, uh, uh, bring down the data volume and the number of parameters. Uh, we did some careful, uh, you know, uh, design of our layers, how many layers, how many uh, parameters to bring down the model complexity, even if even just for the uh, Luma only uh, prediction. We integrated this as an FFmpeg filter, which allows us, you know, to leverage our existing um, um, FFmpeg work chains and basically be able to avoid excessive I.O. and, uh, and be much more uh, effective. We leverage things like a 1DNN library that allows us to do uh, faster inferencing, but a lot more of other things that, unfortunately, I cannot share in this uh, short amount of time. But we, we really spent, uh, uh, you know, a good amount of effort to make this uh, viable. Now, we are not stopping here. This is, we are just getting started. So I really want to, you know, wrap up by going up again in the, in the highest of, of level, which is that we feel this effort uh, paves our journey for more uh, machine learning in the, uh, you know, Netflix video encoding pipeline. And uh, yeah, we are, we are just getting started. Some ideas that you know we are looking at and are floating around are okay. How we can be even more efficient with the solutions uh, when we, we have these neural network use cases? How we can improve on that? Uh, how to do things like you know video denoising, neural network based coding tools which are uh, picking up in popularity, and of course uh, a lot more. And with that, uh, uh, thank you all. And if you have any questions. Uh, feel free to ask. And you can also catch me offline or, or shoot me an email. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Anybody questions? Okay. Come here. <coughs> Thanks for the presentation. Um, it was very interesting. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, I get what you, why you kept the encoder out of the loop, because it's a big challenge. Mm -hmm. I guess you can still model it. Do you have any idea how much, uh, for example, you could uh, compare your gains without the encoder, like with the gains with different uh, bit rates or different compression ratios in the encoder to estimate how much 
you know, depending on the bit rate, uh, that would affect your reconstruction, re you know, when compared to answers. Have uh, you tried to do that? Yes, we, we, uh, the 5% I mentioned, you know, it was uh, basically aggregating uh, across many things. So we looked at the bit rate behavior, we looked at which encoder it was, uh, so, you know, we, we really delved into it. But I would say the biggest difference was not in terms of the bit rate, but in terms of the scaling factor. Mm -hmm. So that's where we saw, you know, the, the biggest um, dimension where the, uh, well, the improvements the would be there. the scaling yeah. factor, yeah. the more room you have for gains. Yes, yes. And also, how, how dependent is it from your upscaling filter then? For example, instead of by cubic, if you replace it for Langsos, do you still see the same kind of gains, or do they...? Yeah, we saw similar uh, amount of gains, but... Um, some, uh, we did some more, you know, rigorous subjective viewing, and we did see some, uh, you know, let's say sometimes there would be some over sharpening or a little bit of things here and there, but I wouldn't say something, you know, that would uh, really change our decision, right? So I would say that it, um, regardless of the upscaler, this is very, like, uh, uh, conservative and, and safe to, to make. And if you notice, actually, the way we have constructed our solution is to ensure that this is the case, right? We build our residuals on top of an existing downscaler rather than, you know, going off on a completely different path, which would mean that uh, the upscaler could, you know, throw us off or something in the encoding could throw us off. So we went a bit more conservative, yeah. but that allows us to fan out, right, because we don't control the devices, but we can very reliably uh, do that we, because we control the downscaling. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I have just a quick question about, uh, you know, to understand how practical the solution is. Can you say a couple of words about the model size, number of parameters, and, like, complexity of the decoder? Not the exact number, but plus minus. You know. uh, there is no, uh, the decoder is, is uh, not influenced at all. So uh, downscaling happens separately from encoding. And given the downscaling that you have, uh, the encoder and the decoder is just uh, the, the same. Nobody knows that, you know, you are not going to, to need to know anything on the device, no playback issues, nothing. This is just purely the, the downscaler. You can think of it instead of saying, you know, FMPEG, downscaled by Lanxos, you can say FMPEG downscaled by uh, the neural network. So nothing on the decoder. On the model complexity, it's a few thousand of parameters. So it's, it's very, very small. It's small. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay on purpose, uh, yeah. yeah. What? what? Uh, I said on, on purpose, we, we, want, we want this to be very cost effective, right? So we didn't uh, have a very complicated solution. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Ah, you have extra, okay. yeah, sorry, just one, one more question. question. Yeah. Hi, Christos. Um, Hello. Uh, so did you notice any uh, content class uh, sensitivity to your downscaler? In other words, would you have advantages if you pre-classified content and then had different models for different kind of content? Did you uh, try any experiments of that nature? Uh, yes. Uh, so what I did see, I, I saw more improvements for animation. So, you know, higher detail preservation, stronger edges. Uh, but um, uh, from the purposes of, of simplicity, uh, you know, we, we wanted to have one model rather than insert yet another, you know, business logic that would pre-classify because then you open up another uh, can of worms, which is, is your classifier good enough? How do these two boxes interact? So we really want simple and wide, wide solutions, not only in terms of upscaling, but also content, encoders, so on and so forth. Okay, thanks. You're Thank welcome. you very much. Yeah.